We're probably going, going to go ahead and start. This session starts about 10 minutes late, and then it'll run for 10, 10 minutes late. And so it's going to, the whole schedule shifts by about 10 minutes. So don't worry, you're not missing anything uh, if you're sticking around until the end of the session. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Peter Sorota. I'm the general manager of Amazon Elastic MapReduce Service, which is a Hadoop-based web service that makes it easy to process data on Amazon infrastructure. There's a lot of hype around big data, so hopefully today I'll help to define big data and talk a little bit about the challenges of big data, which revolve around collection, storage, analysis, and sharing of it. And we'll also have two customers with us that will talk about how they use big data to process, uh, to uh, help with their, uh, with their features and uh, driving innovation in their products. So what is big data? We define big data is when you have data sets so large that you have to start innovating on how you collect, store, analyze, and share that data. Some of our customers ask us, well, you know, do I have enough data to warrant a big data label? Is 10 years worth of stock tick data big data or not? So we define the big data challenge in the form of three Vs. Volume, velocity, and variety. As far as volume is concerned, obviously, the more data you have, the uh, harder it gets to process, to store it, etc. The velocity is also a really important factor. If you have data arriving at you at a really high speed, and you want to understand that data very quickly, that, be, that, posit, that, that essentially creates a challenge. And how do you actually take that data? How do you store it? How do you analyze it quickly if it arrives in a high velocity? Variety. Data comes in various different formats. It comes in a structured format, such as a database schema, it comes in the semi-structured format, such as log files, and a completely unstructured format, maybe binary files uh, or images or videos. So if you wanted to analyze that data holistically, it creates a challenge. How do you analyze data across multiple formats? That is the big data challenge. It is extremely important to analyze large data sets. Um, all of the data you collect is very likely containing important information about your business. And if you look at that information, it can create competitive advantage for you. It can help you understand your customers better. It can help you build products better. It can help understand the bottlenecks or issues with your service so you can fix it and improve the customer performance. Typically, the more data you collect, the better you are the better you're off with that, with that data. So for example, a relatively simple algorithm on a very large data set is, yields to much better use, results than uh, a more complicated algorithm on a very small data set. So collecting the entire data set and analyzing it in, in its entirety is a really important aspect. Data grows at an astonishing rate right now. There's about 2.7 zettabytes, which is a million petabytes of data um, currently in the world, and 90% of it is unstructured data. And it's growing at 40% every year. So we're gonna double in two years. If you look at other indicators as far as big data is concerned, you can see that, for, for example, from indeed.com, you can see that Jobs that require big data expertise are growing at an astonishing rate as compared to jobs that has been a sort of traditional uh, database uh, type jobs. So you see that we also see the big data growth in uh, our own cloud where the data that is stored in Amazon Simple Storage Service is growing exponentially. In fact, we've announced yesterday that we have 1.3 actually trillion objects stored in S3. And it's continued growing exponentially. So you probably see that data growth in your own businesses, in your own applications. 
And with that data growth, you're probably asking yourself the question, so how do I collect, store, analyze, and share data? Let's talk about first the collection piece. There are multiple Amazon technologies that exist to help you collect and aggregate data in the cloud for analytics. For example, S3 import export feature allows you to physically ship your hard disks to us via FedEx and then we'll ingest those into the cloud. S3 Gateway is an appliance that you can install in your data center and then that appliance will help you in the background do offsite backups, disaster recovery, and data mirroring. So you can analyze data in the cloud once you mirror it to the cloud. We have Direct Connect feature that allows you to physically connect your data center through peering to Amazon Public Cloud. And it offers you a low cost, high bandwidth connectivity into AWS so you can stream large amounts of data continuously onto the cloud. And of course, if you have your operations set up in the cloud, in, the, in Elastic Compute Cloud, for example, if you have your server farms or application servers, um, that data is generated on the cloud and you already you know, have it in the cloud so you don't have to move it to the cloud. There's several open source technologies that are available for you to move or stream the data to the cloud. So for example, Apache Flume is a widely used um, open source package that allows you to stream events or log files and aggregate them, pre-aggregate them before you sort of put them into Amazon S3 or directly onto Amazon Elastic MapReduce for further processing. Many of our customers take advantage of that open source tool. Once you've collected data onto the cloud, where do you store it? In AWS, you have a wealth of um, storage solutions. You have relational data store, such as RDS, you have a NoSQL database, which is DynamoDB, you have simple storage service, you have Amazon Elastic MapReduce, which offers HDFS, which is a Hadoop uh, file system that layers on top of a thermal disk. You have HBase, obviously you have data on premise, you have some third party data. And we announced, by the way, yesterday that we have yet another storage solution. Um, so with the Redshift that you, you essentially use as, a, is as a, uh, the, the data warehouse, all, that, all those storage silos create, you know, you generate, accumulate data in all of those storage silos. And there's a really good reason for that. Depending on the structure of your data or access pattern to your data, you will actually need to have a particular a solution different from the other solutions. So for example, if you just want to store log files or images or large objects, S3 is a phenomenal resource for you. It provides level nine durability and you can store any, any data in there. On the flip side, if you have very small objects that you want to store and you want to access those at a really, really high speed, DynamoDB is, not, is an ideal choice for you. So it's a really great solution for you if you wanted to build, a, so for example, a web application or mobile application. RDS, relational data store, is great to store, you know, to store really structured, relatively small data sets in a database like Oracle. Of course, you can shard across multiple machines uh, in RDS, but typically it's constrained to a, a one, one machine. So depending on the application that you have, you will generate data in all of those data, uh, data storage services. Once you've put all your data across all of those data storage services, how do you analyze it holistically? How do you organize that data? How do you clean it? How do you enrich it and condense it? For example, you can take log files and the IP addresses in those log files, and then you can convert them to zip codes. And then further from zip codes, you can get the uh, rich demographic information about your customers. So you can see who the customers are, what the income is, you know, where they're coming from, et cetera. And that information can help you drive better decisions. So let's talk about a particular use case. Imagine you have a customer demographic, maybe sign up information in a SQL table someplace. Maybe it's um, in RDS, maybe it's running in EC2, or maybe it's running on premise for you. And then you have customer order data in DynamoDB. So if you want to improve targeting of your website, 
you ought to be thinking about merging those two data sets and analyzing them holistically together. But really, there's no reason to stop there. Potentially, you have clickstream data that tells you where your customers are clicking at or how they're interacting with your service or your application. And you want to embed that information to further help you define and target uh, the, your application. Maybe you have third-party data sets. Maybe you want to look at sentiment analysis in Twitter and understand what your customers are tweeting about you know, when they talk about your, your application um, or your service. So you want to take all of that data holistically and incorporate it into a targeting model so that you can better serve your customer, be it uh, in the website or application, et cetera. And then once you've created that targeting model, you want to store it someplace, maybe an RDS table or a Dynamo table, et cetera. So that is the big data challenge. You have multiple formats, you have multiple store services, and you want to create or holistically look at the data and then target your customers or improve your customer experience. And once you've done all that, you likely want to generate further reports to see how your business is doing with those adjustments. So you want to run the reports and maybe store them in S3. Maybe it's daily reports or monthly reports, et cetera. So what is this yellow icon in the middle? It's Amazon Elastic MapReduce. It's a Hadoop-based infrastructure service that lets you build sophisticated applications in the cloud that are data processing applications. Elastic MapReduce reduces complexity of Hadoop management. So you don't have to invest into operational aspect of the Hadoop clusters. You don't have to hire um, Hadoop experts to understand how to run the clusters, how to add nodes to the clusters, how to remove nodes from the clusters, how to replace poorly performing nodes from the cluster. All that is done automatically for you. Amazon Elastic MapReduce seamlessly integrates with the rest of AWS services so you can store data in all of those services and use, them, use the data uh, in orchestration. And we have a significant operational experience that you can use if you're running in a, a AWS Elastic MapReduce. In fact, We've ran over 2 million clusters in the last year alone. 2 million Hadoop clusters across very diverse customer base. We have customers such as Airbnb, which is a, a, a startup in the, um, in the travel industry, all the way to um, Fortune 500 customers such as NASDAQ. Forrester Wave named Elastic MapReduce as the number one solution for the support of its diverse data storage services for a number of customers in the ecosystem that we've created on top of Elastic MapReduce. Generally, Hadoop on, running on top of AWS infrastructure lowers the cost of developing and operating distributed system for data processing. As I mentioned, Elastic MapReduce completely removes the necessity for you to invest in operational aspects of Hadoop infrastructure. You don't have to worry about clusters. You can, with a simple API call, launch a cluster. If you wanted to make it bigger, you make another API call and say, hey, I want to add more nodes. You can use spot instances, which allows you to take the capacity of, uh, to essentially run your Hadoop cluster at a really reduced uh, rate and pay for it, essentially, pennies on the dollar. We've integrated with Amazon CloudWatch service, which enables you to keep metrics around your Hadoop performance. So for example, you can run Hadoop and you can see the um, job progress on the graphs. You can see the, um, if, if there's any resource contention on the cluster. And um, you can see if, if there's, a, if there's a, any problems with the health of the cluster. Furthermore, you can set up alerts on various conditions. So for example, if you're running out of space, in HDFS in the cluster, you can set an alert that will trigger an automatic action that will add more nodes. Or you can set an alert if your cluster is running idle. And if the cluster is running idle or, or you know, at a low consumption or utilization rate, you can just automatically trigger an action that would remove node from that cluster. So that flexibility allows you to essentially worry about building applications as opposed to 
building an infrastructure to run the service. Amazon Elastic MapReduce integrates with Amazon S3. You can use S3 as a Hadoop file system. Now, you can also use Hadoop file system as a Hadoop file system outside of S3, but if you, use, if you store all the data in S3, you have 11 night durability, so you don't have to worry about disaster recovery of your Hadoop cluster in case anything goes wrong. You have um, the, uh, you, essentially you can run multiple clusters on top of the data that is located in S3. Uh, and uh, you can uh, really sort of re reduce compute costs because if you store data in S3, you can shut down your cluster and the data still be preserved. And you don't have to pay for the compute cost if you're not using it. So many of our customers use that scheme where they run a production cluster and they store data in S3, and then they run multiple applications that are product of that, of that, that is built on top of that, of that data. So for example, you know, you can uh, pre-process all of your customer clickstream data and build a recommendation engine, and that recommendation engine will be powered off of the data that you store in S3, the result of the model. You can run ad hoc analytics on top of the data that you pre-process with your production cluster. And these ad hoc analysis, they're not going to contend on the same resource of your production cluster. You can build personalization, um, various personalization applications based on the data that you receive and pre-process in, in production. So if you have a production cluster and you store the data in S3, you can have multiple departments in your company accessing the data completely independent from one another. So you can have a financial department looking at the data, marketing, R&D, and they completely don't have any interactions with each other, so they don't have to contend for the same resource. Maybe financial guys only need a small cluster, while the development guys need maybe a really large cluster because they want to test a hypothesis of some sort. They don't have to fight for the same single cluster. They just tune the cluster to the job they have as opposed to tuning the job to the cluster they got. Amazon Elastic MapReduce integrates with DynamoDB, which is our NoSQL database solution. Um, you can have, you can define a database schema in DynamoDB and move the data from Dynamo to S3 for archival purposes. Or if you have maybe a bunch of data in S3 and you want to pre-process it and send the results to DynamoDB, you can do that very easily with EMR. And yesterday, we've announced a new feature here where you can actually replicate DynamoDB tables without actually any schema. So we'll just serialize all the attributes regardless of how many there are and move them to S3 or back. So if you have an S3 bucket, you can just define a DynamoDB table that contains information, so if, for example, if you have log files that contains information about these log files, you just define that, that table in DynamoDB and then you create a cluster, and you have a really simple SQL statement that says, look, load the data from S3 onto Dynamo. You can massage the data as well, but the Elastic MapReduce essentially takes care of the parallelization of the request, launches the cluster, and really efficiently moves that data. Now, if you wanted to... Um, archive some of the data from DynamoDB onto S3, it's just a reverse operation. You define a SQL statement that says take the data from Dynamo and move it to S3. Now what's interesting is if you have data in multiple locations, maybe you have multiple Dynamo tables and you want to query that data holistically, maybe you want to do a join between two tables in DynamoDB, you can use Elastic MapReduce as a query engine for that. If you have data in S3 in DynamoDB and you want to join the data together for some analytics, you can do that as well. It's a really powerful tool. Just 20 minutes ago or so, we've announced a brand new service, Amazon or AWS Data Pipeline. And that service helps you automate these processes that I just described. So it uses Amazon Elastic MapReduce, but you can create a schedule, for example, and do the processing on a, at a particular time. You can say, look, at midnight I want to start my job, 
But don't start my job until the log files showed up on S3. So the job would wait and have this precondition you can define and talk and uh, essentially start the job only when the data arrives. So we further help you to build reliable data processing techniques on top of your data in AWS. So once you analyze the data, how do you share it? How do you visualize it and explore it and decide what to do about your business once you looked at the data? Let's, let's take a look at this particular visualization that one of our customers, Foursquare, did where it tracks the signups across the globe for their service over about a two-year period. You see, the data becomes alive, so you can really understand what is happening with your business, and it can help you drive decisions about where to invest, where your customers are at, should you invest maybe in the localization, and at what point you need to do that. You can build very similar visualizations with Elastic MapReduce because packages like Gplot and Rplot are actually available natively in the cluster. I'm sure everybody's using LinkedIn. And you have a really long list of connections. Now, this picture here actually helps you understand where your connections are coming from. From OPEC, large data set, you actually, now this data comes alive and you can understand how to use it or where, where, your, you know, where your connections are from or where you need to build additional connections. Amazon Elastic MapReduce integrates with services like MicroStrategy to provide business intelligence platform. So you can run reports like this one directly on top of Elastic MapReduce. So various different techniques help you visualize that data and then make data-driven decisions. So what kind of use cases do we see on our platform today? These are probably one, some of the more popular ones, such as digital advertising, analytics, log processing, data warehousing. But if you look at the number of industries and what are the interesting innovation people drive, it's really phenomenal. In life sciences, Elastic MapReduce is used to process genome data. So you, you can have applications such as BLAST and Crossbow analyzing the sequence differences and you know, uh, it's used in the, res in the cancer research and other, in other uh, drug research um, areas. We have people building, improving antivirus checks or antivirus model, uh, models on top of Elastic MapReduce by analyzing the pattern of use across multiple of computers. Financial industry is using this technology heavily to understand fraud, to improve performance of um, real-time trading systems, etc. With that, I want to invite our next speaker, Jim Blomo of Yelp, who is actually going to talk about how they use big data to help their customers. All right, we're live. So uh, my name is Jim Blomo. Thanks for the introduction, Peter. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how we use data to make products and how we use Hadoop and EMR to scale up uh, those products to millions of users and millions of reviews. So the Yelp website is actually hosted on our own data center, but we use EMR to do our big, uh, big processing and offline jobs. So one of the questions uh, that we get a lot is how big is big data? And I think Peter's definition is great. I, I think if you go to like 10 talks today about big data, you're probably going to hear 11 different uh, definitions. So my definition is pretty liberal. I think as soon as you can't process all your data on one computer anymore, you have a big data problem. And with software like Hadoop and EMR, you really don't have any excuse for not using a really robust system when you're working with uh, distributed systems. Because they're tricky, and so using this type of software uh, is much better than trying to do something on your own, whether you need two machines or 200 machines. Um, one of the interesting things about Yelp's data, in particular, is its variety. So obviously we have a lot of reviews, but we also have a ton of user information, such as user profiles, business information, such as open hours and their category, uh, behavioral information, like check-ins, 
and unstructured data like photos of uh, people or businesses. Um, so trying to join that all up can be a big challenge, and EMR lets us do that. So we have terabytes of data in logs, terabytes of data in uh, databases, such as MySQL, and we have additional data, uh, extra data, derived data, that we store in S3 and some in Hypertable. Uh, so some of these solutions, like what do we use this data for, I think that's one of the most important parts. Um, at the kind of base level uh, for analytics, we try to just understand general trends. So uh, is mobile usage growing faster than website usage and where? Like Peter said, understanding your customers is really important. So figuring out where they are, what's hot, uh, can be a, a, a real requirement uh, for using this type of data. Um, figuring out search relevance, like click-through rates, what are searches that are not getting any clicks in particular. Actually, at my last company, we wanted to take a look at that, and we found that the word help was most often searched for, uh, and it was really useful, right? We didn't have any uh, links for help on how to use our product, and so people were trying to search for it. So those kinds of insights of looking at your uh, behavior and log data can really help you dr drive products and decisions. At the next level, data summarization. We use that for trying to provide information to customers, um, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail in the next slides. Uh, spam filtering is a big problem for us, right? You don't want to go to a website and see a bunch of reviews by the business owner saying, hey, this is a number one business. Um, so we need to figure out when that business owner is reviewing their own business and try to filter those reviews and, and take them off the main page. So using behavioral data from logs and information from our database, combining those together to make a model of a user is uh, really helpful in, in making a useful product. And similarly for advertising, being able to figure out what is going to be useful to your users in particular situations uh, is what this, uh, what this big data drives in general. Um, so let's dig into one of these uh, specific solutions. Review highlights is a feature that we have um, to take those thousands of reviews for a, a business um, and summarize them in a way that's useful for a customer, right? So if, if we have a thousand reviews, we don't expect someone to take the weekend off uh, to read through this like book size page of reviews in order to figure out where to go to dinner. They kind of just want a glimpse of what's interesting about this business. And that's what we do for review highlights. So we take data uh, and reviews, particularly from our database, dump them onto S3, and then run a Hadoop job over that data to figure out what are the phrases that are very frequent in reviews for this business, but are not frequent elsewhere. And as you can see, this is one of my favorite bars in San Francisco. The top one is Tamale Lady. And no, that's not a mistake. The Tamale Lady is real, and she will serve you tamales in the, in the outdoor patio. So if you guys ever come to San Francisco, check out Zeitgeist. I might be there enjoying a tamale myself. Uh, so the next category is uh, query to category. <clears throat> um, and the question here is, when people do a search, for example, like pool, what do they mean? Do they, do they mean uh, being able to swim laps at a public pool? Or do they, they want to go play pool in a pool hall or billiard hall? Or do they want like pool cleaning supplies for their, their pool in their back door? Or uh, the fourth option, my favorite, is a pool table in a pool so you could swim, swim while playing pool. <clears throat> uh, so what we do to kind of understand this, uh, this type of problem is we look at user behavior we look at these terms that um, customers search for, and then what type of businesses did they end up clicking on? And so with that information, we can kind of figure out, uh, for these particular phrases, they're most often associated with these particular categories, and then we can display appropriate information, uh, display appropriate businesses for a particular query. Uh, and it turns out, for English language at least, the pool halls here are just uh, eking out a victory over other, uh, over other pool types. One of my colleagues was saying that he thinks that's an indication that Americans in particular are lazy and we'd rather shoot pool than, than exercise and swim laps. But, uh, but I was thinking it might be interesting to break that down by state or by city or even by person, right? You can imagine how much more complex that is. 
And one of the advantages of EMR is if you want to make those distinctions, you want to scale up that way, it's, it's possible and easy. So uh, like I was saying, and, and Peter was saying, one of the big advantages here is developer speed. Uh, being able to roll out features, do tests, without having to interact and try to uh, grab resources for yourself um, from different teams or, or contest with the reports that need to run each night for finance uh, or the jobs that need to run in order to provide this production data. Um, it makes us uh, able to launch features faster because as soon as the code and the algorithm's ready, we could push it out to production and have those clusters spun up when we need them. Uh, and another way that we try to uh, move through uh, tests and jobs quickly is by using uh, MR job, or as we like to call it, Mr. Job. This is the, the uh, mascot of Mr. Job, the elephant shrew. <clears throat> if anyone gets that joke, no? All right. <laughs> Tough crowd. So, um, so Hadoop streaming is a feature in Hadoop that lets you uh, run arbitrary commands over the data uh, that's, that's coming in and out of, um, of your job. And what MR job does is allow you to really write e uh, easy jobs in Python, uh, as well as hook those jobs together at a higher level. Many of the Hadoop jobs that people end up running in production, it's not just map and then reduce. It's map and then reduce, and then map that some more, and then reduce that some more, and then additionally reduce that data set. And MR job makes defining that uh, and running that really easy. Um, it can also be used on your local machine. So you don't need to spin up a whole Hadoop cluster just to test your code. You could test it on a small subset on your laptop or on your developer workstation and then run that same exact code in EMR or even your in-house Hadoop cluster. So I don't think any uh, map reduce talk is complete without a word count example. So here's some code about how you use um, MR job to do a simple word count operation. And as you can see, if I zoom out a little bit, <clears throat> as you can see here, uh, we have a mapper and reducer that represent those map and reduce steps. Uh, and if you're familiar with the map reduce paradigm, you know that usually in Java, you kind of emit key value pairs and take in key value pairs. Well, instead here, we're using yield, which in Python is a little more idiomatic. Um, but I think the major point here is there's very few lines of code here um, compared to the Java equivalent. And then additionally, the library includes all the uh, steps you need in order to spin up that Hadoop cluster of 10 or 100 machines and run this code. And like I said, before starting up that cluster, developers run this code on their local workstations to make sure they don't have any compiler errors or uh, unexpected data that, that comes in and crashes your job. So this is just one of the open source packages that we have. Uh, we have a, a number of different tools that we use to integrate with EMR and Hadoop and uh, AWS services in general. Like I said, for a lot of our jobs, we take data from MySQL dump it out and upload it into S3. And again, the advantage there is we can have an almost arbitrary number of people going over database data without having to provision uh, 20 different databases for different usages. So uh, S3 MySQL dump does that dumping for you. Uh, EMRIO takes a look at your EMR usage and suggests billing improvements that can save you money if you're using uh, EMR a lot. Uh, Tron is a, uh, is a batch process scheduler, so it tries to figure out uh, what are the dependencies for this job, what needs to run before this happens, and if this job finishes, what other batches can I run? And it works both locally and with MR job so that your local batches can depend on your EMR batches and vice versa. A big use case for this is uh, for these features I talked about, we calculate those features in EMR and then bring them into the data center in MySQL in order to serve them transactionally when we need them. There's many more libraries here. I encourage you guys to check them out. Uh, GitHub.com slash Yelp or opensource.yelp.com. And I don't think I can uh, walk away without telling you guys that we are hiring. So if you like big data stuff or anything from the front end, mobile development to back end, uh, we do uh, uh, have positions probably in the area you're interested in. 
So I'll be around afterwards um, to answer any questions. I think with that, I'll uh, turn it over to, oh, back to Peter, who can introduce Steve here. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Mr. Job is a, an excellent open source library that Yelp has introduced, but now it's been actually adopted by a very large number of our customers. I highly encourage you to uh, use that library because it actually makes it very, very easy to run, to, run, to run jobs and getting started with Hadoop. Now I'd like to introduce Steve Martinfield of Etsy, who's going to talk about how Etsy is using data to better serve their customers. Hey guys, uh, my name is Steve. Uh, I'm a data engineer at Etsy, and I'm going to be talking about uh, automated EB testing. I know you went, you went. But first, let's talk about Etsy. Etsy is an online marketplace where you can find handmade and vintage goods. We have over 800,000 sellers, and they're all selling their unique items, uh, like this screen-printed T-shirt, which is a, a riff on the classic Black Flag, Black Flag T-shirt, which I really like. Um, and at Etsy, we believe in pushing lots of small incremental changes. And this means two things. This means that we're pushing code every day, usually about 30 times a day on average. And it also means that our site is continually evolving. So the Etsy that you, that you see today is a little bit different from the Etsy that you see the day before and the day before. And so when we're working in such a dynamic environment, we really want to understand the impact of our changes. We want to understand if the change that we're making today and the next hour, we really want to understand it what the impact of. Is that improving the Etsy experience or is that hindering it? So I'm going to illustrate this through a toy example. Uh, this is our search page. And search works on Etsy just like it does anywhere else. You enter a query and you get a set of results back. And in this case, we're getting uh, a set of listings back and they're represented by images. Uh, search is a key feature and the majority of people find that the items that they're looking for through search. And you'll also notice that the top row of our search page is ads. And we know that a lot of people view ads with skepticism. So we're going to experiment with this. We're going to see what happens when we distinguish these ads from the organic results by highlighting them, by coloring them with this shade of avocado. It's a little subtle. It's hard to see. But we're going to make this change, and we're going to see what happens. And so when we make this change, we're going to ask ourselves, is this, is this a change for the better? And in order to answer that question, we have to do a couple things. First, we have to decide on a set of metrics that will let us evaluate this change. So in this case, we're looking at search. And so we have to understand the, the point of search and, and what we could expect to see changing. And so uh, one of the obvious things to look at is clicking. If people see the items that they're looking for, they're going to be clicking through to the next image. And so we're going to look at the click-through rate. But I'm not sure if click-through rate is, is enough. What happens if someone actually clicks through and they get completely disgusted with the item that they're looking at and then they leave? So we're also going to look at engagement. And there's a bunch of different things that we can look at to proxy engagement. Are people adding this item to their cart? Are they favoriting it? Are they clicking through and looking at the shop and more items? We can also see if they're actually purchasing this item. So these are all kind of intuitive, obvious things to look at. There's also some other things which are less obvious. Uh, such as the, the, the depth of a search page. How many searches do people usually look at? So we would expect this to actually decrease. If people are, look, are finding items that, that they like, they're probably not going to go onto the seventh or eighth or ninth page because they've already found the item that they're looking for in the, on the first page or the second page. So this is a little bit non-intuitive. So we're going to look at this as well. And so let's move on to some real data. This is a purchase data from Etsy. And there's a lot of variation in this graph, and you can actually understand a lot about how Etsy works just by looking at this graph. And we spend a lot of time looking at graphs. So you can see there's all these peaks. Each of these peaks represents a day. And these peaks are bimodal. So you can see that people are purchasing a lot in the early morning and the late and the early evening as well. There's less purchases in the middle of the night. And in addition to this daily variation, we have a weekly variation as well. So there's two Sundays represented in this graph. I believe they're the 14th and the 21st of October. And you can see that there's less people purchasing on Sundays. And so we've gathered a lot of knowledge just by looking at this one simple graph. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to release our search ads change. So we're going to have this new search ads, which is colored in avocado. And we're going to look at this graph, and we're going to try to understand if we've actually changed anything for the better. And looking at this graph, it's pretty much impossible. There's too much stuff going on. And there's a lot of reasons why it's hard to look at this graph and understand this. But the main reason is that there's all these external factors influencing every change. Every time we push a change, there's a thousand things happening in the world. And it, it's impossible to kind of isolate right now just by looking at this graph whether search ads is not doing well because the internet is down in Brooklyn or because no one likes avocado color. So what we want to do is we want to isolate this change. We want to control for all the noise in the world and just look at the difference between this avocado color and the old search ads. And luckily for us, there's a technique that allows us to do this pretty easily. And this technique is called A-B testing. I'm pretty sure all of you guys have heard of A-B testing, but I'm just going to describe it anyway. Uh, the basic premise of A-B testing is you're going to divide people into two groups. We're going to have a control group and an experimental group. And as people come to the site, we're going to bucket them randomly into one of these two groups. And what we're going to do is we're going to have parallel versions of the site running at the same time. The group that is the control group is going to see the same site that they've always seen. The experimental group is going to see the new site. And so in this case, they're going to see the avocado color. We're going to look at a set of metrics which, which we've already decided, which we just decided previously. And we're going to use statistics to eliminate all the noise that's present in this. And we're also going to use statistics to tell us how long we should run this, this test for. And then we're going to look at these two different sets of metrics. And we can easily evaluate if the change is better or worse or there is no difference. So uh, moving forward with our example, as people come to the site, 95% of them are going to see the same site that they've always seen before. There is no difference in search ads. And the lucky 5% is going to see this avocado color. And this is a sticky change. So this is going to be consistent. If I come to the site 10 times and I get stuck with the avocado color, then I'm going to continually see this. And there's a couple of reasons we do this. But the main two are it makes the math easier and it makes our assumptions uh, it, it just, it's much nicer. But the other real reason is that this is a better experience for our users. They don't have to have a constantly changing site underneath them. They always see the same thing. And so we're going to run this change for a week, and then we're going to come back and look at results. And so here are our results. And these are two graphs that represent the data that we just talked about. On the left is the, the view listings. So this is basically a proxy for click-through rate. There is two lines here. Each line represents a group. And unfortunately, the avocado color is represented by blue, and the control group is re represented by green. And if we look at these graphs, we can see that there is a little bit of uh, oscillation that's happening. You know, One day, the, the avocado color is better, and one day, the uh, control group is better. And, but we're going to look at these, this data in aggregate, and we're going to use statistics. And it's going to tell us that there's actually no difference between these two groups. So we have not increased click-through rate, but we have not decreased click-through rate. So that's OK. Another thing which is important to look at when looking at these graphs is that both of the click-through rate for the control group and the experimental group is declining. So if we were to simply release this and look at the click-through rate after we've released it, it would look like search ads was decreasing that rate. And we know by looking at this graph that this is actually not the case. So that's important. The other graph here is the average number of searches and search pages that people look at on a visit. And this is what we talked about before. Are people looking at eight? Pages? Are they looking at nine pages? Or are they looking at two pages? And here, they're approximately, it's around nine. And although this, this data is pretty similar, they trend together, unfortunately, the avocado group, people are looking at more pages here. So I don't think this is enough information to completely make a decision on it, but it's certainly a data point that we can look at. So we should continue to look at the rest of the metrics that we have. Both of these graphs represent uh, purchases. So this is the, the purchase rate from people that are actually looking at search. On the left is a delta. So this is the change in the experimental group compared to the control group. So we can see that this is always below. Uh, our new change is actually doing much worse. We've managed to decrease the conversion rate, which actually is sales. We're selling less stuff because of this change. And on the right is the same data, except we're looking at these rates day by day. So we could see day by day these rates are jumping up and down because there's a lot of noise and, and things like that in there. But over time, we can see that you know, there, this, this isn't really working. So this experiment is a wash. So we're going to revert our change, and we're going to turn off this experiment. But we learned something here. We've learned that we have not managed to, to change something for the better. And th this is an important distinction from just releasing a change and hoping it works because we think it works. And so this process is incredibly useful. 
Uh, it's very useful for products like search uh, and backend changes where it's really hard to determine differences in ranking and things like that. And we really like this process. Uh, so we've automated it. We started with a, a manual process. We were doing these things on an ad hoc basis and involved a, a hodgepodge of uh, Hadoop jobs and R scripts and SQL queries, and it took a really long time to answer these questions. And the, these are really important and valuable questions, and we want to know the answers for them. So we built this internal tool. And we call this tool the AB Analyzer. And what this tool does is it standardizes the entire process. It takes care of data collection, data processing, statistics, and visualization, and you basically have uh, something that looks like this. This is a screenshot of the tool. Uh, it's basically a bunch of graphs and a bunch of metrics, and they're all related to your experiment. And one of the important things about the AB Analyzer is that all this data is pre-computed. So as you're doing your analysis and you're looking through and you want to look at something else, maybe we decide we actually want to look at favoriting as well, all you have to do is you go to a drop-down menu and you add it, and you don't have to wait any more time. You don't have to wait another week. You don't have to do any more processing. All the data is already here. We have tens, if not hundreds, of metrics that are pre-computed for every single experiment that is running on the site. And so this is really valuable for us. So we can focus on the decisions and the analysis and not the data collection and the entire pipeline going on here. And this tool also is, is hooked into our deployment process. So running A-B tests is really easy at Etsy. All you have to do, it takes five minutes to wrap any change that's going on in the site into an A-B test. So this means that we're running lots and lots of tests. And when you run lots of tests, you discover that your assumptions aren't always correct. And they're not correct for a couple reasons. Sometimes you have a bad idea, but more often than that, we have a good idea and we have a bad implementation. Maybe you know this avocado color looks terrible in Chrome. And so we can use A-B testing to figure that out. And the precautionary tale is that A-B testing isn't a replacement for your brain. It's a supplement. We use data to inform decisions. Every change in every product has a story, and the data verifies or disproves this story. So this is an important thing to know. As you run A-B tests, what we're doing is we're building up intuition and knowledge. And all this intuition and knowledge means that we have better products in the end. We understand how people are using our products, and we understand uh, if they're using them the way that we expected them to use. So in summary, I would say that A-B tests allow us to reveal the impact of any changes actually going on on our site. And by lowering the barri barrier to A-B testing, it simply means that we have more tests. And the more tests that we have, the more knowledge we have, the more intuition, and of course, the better products that we have. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce Peter again. So.